Now, another aspect of life it is that it evolves. Now, as an organism, nothing evolves because you would die the way you were born. Your genes would not change unless some sort of something like uh, happens to you, like it happened to Spider Man, and that's the chances of that are very minute. And the science of that is not, doesn't make much sense. But in a way, um, no no events of that kind have been registered where somebody mutates successively and completely changes the, the kind of life that they are before they die. Besides, that was not really evolution because it doesn't really it's not really tied into what's happening to the environment. So organisms do not evolve, but as a population, things evolve, and over time they change. And all the life on Earth comes from pre-existing life. That is another aspect of life that's very important to talk about. And there's three areas which I want to talk about. First is the idea of what is evolution. Now, evolution is not about so much the origin of life. It's it's more about how what happens to life that it's already here, how it changes with time in response to the environment, and how things come from other things because of this idea. And the idea is that there's a lot of evidence, both biological, anatomical, uh, field biology, fossils like the ones you, that are represented here in the picture, that life has been changing with time and space depending on the environment that has existed throughout time and in different places of the Earth. And so that there seems to be a pattern between what happens with life across time and across space, that, that some species go extinct and new species show up. That life has not always been the same. So regardless of how life started, the theory of evolution talks about how life has changed since the beginning of time. And that is what we talk about when we talk about evolution. And the principle behind it is the idea that it's tough to stay alive. That, you know, we live in a dangerous world where uh, there's a limit to how many people can possibly be sustained by the ecosystem. That, you know, people are constantly dying from starvation, from predators, from disease, from old age, from accidents, from natural disasters. A lot of different reasons that uh, animals are constantly under pressure from the environment and that it's hard to live in this environment. And that within this environment, everything there is alive, there's a lot of variety between life. Not just between species, but also within the species. There's a lot of different kinds of flies, a lot of different kinds of butterflies, a lot of different kinds of flowers of the same genus, a lot of different kinds of snails, a lot of different kinds of people. Nothing is the same. Everything is unique. And because of the inherent variety that exists in lives, and the fact that all this life is going to have to fight to survive in this environment, that means that there's constant competition for survival. But because they're different from each other, that means that if you have the best set of adaptations, which are unique features, which makes you more likely to survive, either because you can reproduce in large numbers, or because you can escape detection by a predator because you hide in the environment, or because you have the right beak to eat the, eat the right food that's available in your environment, or because you have behaviors like being a part of a pack or migrations, or because you know how to fight, or the conjunction of everything you got, you have the best set of adaptations on your environment. That makes it more likely for you to have children. And the more children you have, the more the traits that you have are passed on. And so those traits will eventually become more common in the population. This is a process that we call natural selection. Through natural selection, over time, the traits which are better for survival within a certain environment will become more common. Notice, for example, that if you're talking about a white environment, the white butterfly is, it has an advantage because it hides. But if it's talking about a darker environment, the darker butterfly has an advantage. So natural selection is immediately tied to whatever is happening with the environment. So if the environment changes, what is good also changes. But the point is that this will ultimately cause variation in life. Uh, you see here in a representation of this natural selection that you have in the beginning a lots of white, great, and darker little uh, bugs in the population, but that the predator can spot the lighter ones easier. And that means that over time the population becomes darker because only the ones which are darker tend to survive and have more children. So th there's a large population and there's variety in the, po in the population, but there's more people that can survive, so there's struggle for existence. And because of these differences that exist between them, there's going to be difference, difference in reproductive success and in survivability of, the, of those people. That leads to adaptations over time, and that is the concept that's being displayed over here. Now, the ultimate consequence of this is that life changes over time and that all life that is on Earth came from previous life that was not exactly like the life that exists right now. In other words, there is descent with modification. That all the life that exists today is a version, a new adapted version of life that existed before. And that we see elephants today, and there's even three kinds of elephants still around, and there's also manatees, which are part of the same big family of them. But 
all the other branches of that tree of life are gone. Likewise, the, the tree of life of the horses, most of those horses are not around anymore. Most of those branches went extinct. But some of the branches are still around because some of those ecosystems are still around. They're still viable on those ecosystems. They may have changed a bit, though. Same thing with humans. The previous versions of homos, which are the genus for, the, for, the, for men, have, have changed over time as the environment of the world changes over time. That also means that all the life on Earth eventually comes from previous existing life, and which means at some point all the life on Earth merges at one single original point, and that things share common ancestors. Now, obviously, we're closer to things like elephants than we are to things like plants, but in a way, both of us must share an ancestor because all of us are eukaryotic. We both have internal organelles inside of ourselves, which means both animals and plants came from an ancestral species which had that feature. But then they changed in different directions as they were exposed to different conditions. And that is the idea of evolution, that we descend with modification, which ultimately means we, we have common ancestry. But remember that this happens as a population changes. You cannot change. You were born with the genes that you were born and you would die with the same genes. But as generations pass on and people have more babies if they have the better traits, then that changes. So it's a population that changes across generation, not a single organism. Now, that aspect of evolution is pretty well accepted in science because it's clear that life is changing, that life exists today that had not existed before, and therefore there must be a method for life to change over time. But there's also the other aspect about how did life start it. Now, to answer that question, you have to go back to what is life. Now, there used to be a theory that perpetuated modern society, the idea of vitalism, that life, there's something special about life, some sort of essence, some sort of power, which comes from some sort of source. And this is part of not of many religions and still today a lot of people believe that life has an essence that cannot be replicated. In science we say it's not about that. It's about a set of physical rules. It's physical science that determines uh, the, the survivability of, of life. It all started with things were more likely to, to survive than others and eventually it became more specialized over time. Very complex and we'll talk about that later. But whatever you, we got without getting philosophical about life there are two major branches of, of ideas in life. One branch was the idea that life comes out of nowhere. It just shows up in what's called spontaneous generation. And this idea comes from the people that saw early, old time ago, maggots growing on things like, you know, uh, meat that's left out or rats coming out of the grain suddenly. But obviously, that has to, it's the lack of observation that led to conclusions like that. It's mythicism because if you really pay attention, you realize that this doesn't happen like that. In fact, in the 1600s, a scientist called Reedy proved that it wasn't out of nowhere that those maggots were coming from. You needed the flies. If you were to cover the jar, that's the independent variable, the dependent variable, which is the growth of maggots, would not happen. So he compared covering with not covering and he realized that the, jar, the, the maggots would not grow the meat if the flies could not uh, access the meat. And if you were to cover the jar with, say, something that let the smell get through, but not the, the access to the meat, they would still lay the eggs on top of that cloth, but they would not be grow on the meat itself. That experiment ultimately proved that life doesn't come from everywhere. Anywhere, it has to come from a source. But then, another scientist called Spallanzini uh, showed that um, even after you boil broth, and they used to do this kind of stuff with water and other types of liquids because they figured out that if you boil the liquid, the stuff that was inside it died and then it was, it was, it was okay to eat it. It was very unlikely for you to get sick from it. What they were actually doing it is that they were killing the bacteria that were inside even though they didn't know that that's what they were doing. But he noticed that even if you boiled it, if you left the container open, it would still go bad. But if you sealed the container, it would not go bad. So he says, see... It is coming out of somewhere sometimes, but it comes out of nowhere. It comes out of thin air. So it is still vitalism. But then the, the Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, another scientist, showed that it wasn't coming out of thin air, that it was something in the air that was making that happen. Because he put this little circular thing on top of the, of the same kind of design that Spallanzini did. And he showed that if you had this little uh, turn on, on the vial, 
even though it was still open to the air, so air could go in and out of the container, it would not go bad. The broth would stay okay. And what was happening there is that the microorganisms that were in the air were having trouble getting through the vial, and they were dying before they got all the way around because there was no food in this little long stretch over here. So they would die before they got all the way inside. And that's why uh, it, it ended up proving that life had to come from previous existing life bacteria that was in the air and the bacteria died in there and he actually found that there were microorganisms uh, inside of that little turn over there. So this shows that life has to come from previous life in the concept of called biogenesis. That all life that exists come from previous life and ultimately led to the development of the germ theory. That all diseases are caused by microorganisms like you see here on the screen. And this was uh, discovered by another scientist called Koch. Uh, a German uh, in scientist. Now, then in modern science, there's an idea to contradict that theory that life can only come from pre-existing life. It's the idea of abiogenesis, that the original origin of life was not from life, but from a primordial soup where there was a lot of chemicals uh, of the early earth, which under certain conditions could form the basic chemicals necessary for life. And once you have that in place, if that increases the chances of that chemical to self-replicate, natural selection takes over and life will start. We'll talk about this in detail when we talk about uh, life in the beginning, but uh, in evolution. But the idea of abiogenesis is the idea that life did start from without life and uh, a set of chemical reactions governed by physical principles of science though. So, uh, but that is a little more contradictory than evolution but it's not the same thing evolution has to do with life changing when it's already around the origin of life is another issue entirely we do know that today though the majority of things you see alive come from previous existing things but that does not mean that the original life must have come from from uh, from a previous existing life but it certainly did not come spontaneously out of nowhere there is a physical process for that so it's not spontaneous generation or vitalism but it's also possible to have abiogenesis